Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 17 of the Cube Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We're breaking down the stories of the week. We've been traveling since Cube Month. Dave, we had a lot of events. I just flew in from New York. You were in <laughs> Vegas, came in on the red eye. I mean, look, so much going on again in tech. This is our weekly podcast where we break down what we're covering uh, in the news at large that we think is interesting, stuff we we're looking at and that our audience is interested in, but also at enterprise tech as well. Uh, HPE had their event, MongoDB had their event in New York City. I saw all the analysts, we saw the Wall Street analysts. Um, Zuck and Elon want to do a cage match. Cybersecurity and super cloud news is out there. HP, uh, AWS announced a $100 million innovation fund for AI. Um, HP's got traction, you had Amazon on stage with HP. Mongo stock popped huge. They got this developer data platform. I wrote a post about that that went viral. They have a position that looks like it's unique and looks like they got a really strong presence. And I just read all the Wall Street analysts. They are bullish on this stock. They think it's going to be a $5 billion uh, revenue number in, in five years. They're at like one point and change now, 1.6 or something. And then Intel made a fab deal, FTC going after uh, AWS. And I know this is going to be your rank as you telegraph it on Twitter. Um, it is such a bogus thing. The cloud wars continues. Google's making moves. Okay, and you've got some real traction going on in super cloud and the whole multi-cloud fabric thing I want to get into. I learned a lot at HPE Discover and I learned a lot in New York City with MongoDB because you have the tail of developers and you have the tail of the large big enterprise with HPE and Mongo, they own the developer market and their document database is perfectly poised for AI. It's just more AI, big week coming up. We got Snowflake and Databricks. Uh, and a slew of interviews. I think we're going to be talking to at least 100 companies uh, in the next week. Um, and last week felt like 100 as well, Dave. It's just been an incredible week. I, um, I, I obviously wasn't at mongodb.local because I was at H HP Discover and you were there, but I was watching a ton of the coverage uh, this morning. When I got in like, I, I think I landed at five o'clock, so I got in really early. And I, I really liked uh, the, the Atlas vector search. I just wrote a wrote a post while I was waiting for you to come in here. That, that Atlas vector search is really interesting uh, because it's an alternative to having a separate standalone vector database and obviously is something that is going to be interesting for generative AI. And then they, they surprised a lot of people with stream processing for Atlas. I thought that was kind of cool. And they, you know, they made the general availability of the relational migrator. I remember a couple of years ago, maybe it was last year or two years ago, Oracle did a Mongo uh, DB sort of compatibility mode, but this is sort of the reverse of that, where like, we can we can take the relational data in. So you're seeing Mongo just extend the different data types, and that's what that's what platforms hey, do. I think I my thunder, Dave. I was going to write a post. But I guess I had to get off that plane. <laughs> yeah. China, By the way, you nailed the this, post on, on your conclusion. You pretty much nailed what I, I just went through. I just read eight of the Wall Street houses that had comments. A couple of people didn't publish anything today, but major bullish sentiment on MongoDB. And again, category creation opportunity for them, clear headroom in the TAM of a database market that they only have 2% of and the database market's changing and growing. So as you have a, a huge TAM in databases and a changing market in how the developers are setting the agenda for buying decisions. So you have the dorm room into the boardroom. And I heard some other analysts quote in my boardroom comment. It was, it was great to see yesterday. I think uh, Daniel Newman was brought that up as well. That's the theme. They own the dorm room hackathons and they now go into the boardroom where executives are writing checks so they're targeting, uh, as Maribel Lopez points out, the check writers, okay? That's the buyers. MongoDB doesn't usually sell to that market, Dave. They are, they're targeting the developers. So you're seeing, again, the developer first. We've been talking about this dynamic in the open source <laughs> community for years. That's playing out. We talked about this in the SuperCloud One event we had in San Francisco. Yeah. And we were right again. And our research and our analysis was right early and often on this topic, you know, we've been in open source from day one, and it just continues to surprise and, and delight in terms of what's happening in the marketplace. Again, developers and software have, is killing it. I think we might have talked about this last week. Essentially what Mongo did is they pulled forward, like by a year, its, its numbers and its expectations. So of course, Wall Street's salivating, and this thing was a screaming buy before they announced. I mean, at the end of last year, we were talking about how Mongo was getting beat up 
and uh, like like all tech stocks. But you know, look, and I had Ivana Delevska on, um, and she's like a mini Kathy Woods, like uh, Arc Investments, and and you know she buys the dip on Snowflake, on Nvidia, on Mongo, because these are platform plays that have sustainable competitive advantage. And so Mongo is, you know, they're, they're getting it done. I mean, the, the the event looked great, looked intimate, smaller than last year. Last year was actually pretty big, uh, but I thought they got a lot of content out in one day. Yeah, they totally did. Um, I talked to the CTO and and what really is happening is, is that even Mongo's kind of scratching themselves going, wow, pinch me moment, because you know their whole business is about developers. and. They got lightning in a bottle as a commercial entity, and, and you love the term operating leverage. You use that all the time when you're breaking analysis. They have operating leverage in their model because they have a platform now, and they have the developers, so they're growing with their developers. Because what's happening is anyone can use MongoDB. Again, it's open source, okay? And so you can grab it, you can use it, so it is the dorm room, and then now you get to the boardroom dynamic, which is the companies are making a decision to stay with Mongo as a platform. So having these new native services built in, like streaming, like um, vector search. By the way, there's other solutions out there with vector search and streaming, Confluent, Kafka, and other, other uh, open source um, um, vector data like Milvus, which we use, and others. Uh, Weave.io, I think was one another one. So, Pinecone. So, so yeah, Pinecone. And, and so what you're having is that you can snap things together or you can build them natively, right? So. This is a kind of a nuanced tech talk point, but the, you know, the winners are building things natively into a platform, okay? And that's where you start to see the big breakout stock. So if I'm a stock buyer, I'm an investor, I'm looking for two things, the platform mindset where it's native services and primitives and data, okay? You can't get better data than developers having their code. And that everything comes together. You get observability goes into place. You got container security falls into place, software supply chain, and then document database is actually perfectly positioned because you think of a document, I think of like a Word doc or a Google doc, it's text, right? And so it's unstructured data. So NoSQL actually has a nice win into creating new kinds of insights that have never been garnered before. Okay, that's where the killer apps are. So that means the applications are gonna sing cool things from that because then the apps could take advantage of that data, get those new insights, whether it's some operational insight or some insight for a user, their customer. So again, this is net new, Dave. You know, AI's been around for a while. You know, I've heard that rant before, right? But yeah, it has, but not this kind of way. So look at the people with the data. We talked about this last week. If you got the data, you are in the driver's seat. Now you got to have the developers. So developers, de developer market, data market are going to explode. And then everything else is going to be about efficiency and transit, uh, latency, performance, availability, distributed um, uh, failover. I mean, it's going to be an exciting So I think Mongo is a, a tell sign to me of what's going to come in at reInvent. It's going to be very interesting to see what AWS does, Dave, at reInvent because Last year, they were kind of scratching the surface of the top of the stack, and Adam Selesky had a great vision. He actually brought up LLMs in my one-on-one -on -one with him, so he actually is, is on point on this. Amazon is not behind on, on this at all. But it's going to be interesting to see how their posture is at reInvent. With well, did you see him on system. Bloomberg this week? Did you, did you watch that interview? No, I did not. I saw the announcement we covered on SiliconANGLE, the $100 million innovation fund. But that yeah, but so... So he came on Bloomberg and they were pressing him, basically saying, hey, well, you guys are behind, right? And he said, well, no, we've, we've been one. doing LLMs for a million. You know, I, I would agree that, I mean, they have been doing, I mean, Adam, when we did our sit down with Adam last year, you know, prior to uh, reInvent, prior to ChatGPT being announced, he said, remember he said, you know, we're doing a lot in large language models and this is going to be huge. Yeah. And so it's not like they weren't, they weren't signaling even back then. I'll say this though, I got a glimpse at the latest ETR data for July. The July surveys in the field is like 1,300 responses um, already. Yeah. They'll probably get up to 17 or 1,800. Open AI like shot to the top. It's unbelievable in that whole space. So you have the th big three cloud providers, Microsoft, they're always in, you know, up and to the right. AWS, and this is, we're talking about the ML AI space. Mm -hmm. 
And then Google, of course, is there. They're all above the 40% highly elevated spending momentum line. And then Databricks is up there as well. ChatGPT or OpenAI rather just rocketed to the top of the momentum almost as pervasive already as Microsoft. And I did see, John, Amazon's still prominent, but they did move a little bit to the left, meaning yeah. they weren't cited as much as a percentage of the overall survey. And it's probably a function of open AI just rocketing to the top. Now, I, I think that's going to be, you know, short lived. I think open AI is getting all the attention and Microsoft right now, but, but I think Amazon's strategy is a winning strategy. Oh, of course it is. And I'm going to be waiting to finish. I, want, I, I like your, when you went there because this is what our research has shown. And my research in particular in the field comes out, comes out this way. Um, and this is not this has not been reported yet, so it's it's kind of original content. So um, the team should write this up as as a key point. The reason why Amazon's getting bashed right now is because their business model is to stand up and run apps. Okay, so their infrastructure and that's always been great. I as PaaS, their services like Bedrock are emerging. So that's just packaging what they've already had. So they announced that again. I had an exclusive with Matt Garman a couple of weeks ago. My story is about to about to hit on his view of Amazon. Here's where things are landing. Hugging Face, OpenAI, Databricks, Snowflake, MongoDB, the big data titans now. I call them the big data titans. Snowflake, Databricks, and Mongo. They're now the big three titans, in, in my opinion. And then you got um, the infrastructure. And the cloud guys. You keep you, you yeah. right the cloud guys. So, so you where where the market is right now mm -hmm. is, is that certainly it's hyped. And, and you know, so Om Malik had a tweet today when Salesforce jumps on AI, you know, it's hyped. Actually, we mentioned them in, in our in our podcast last week, so we, we kind of were early on that. But on this whole Amazon doing well or not, it's they're waiting for the, the storm to come, the big surge. Because what's all the actions with open AI and and the developer side right now, because all the all the work's being done is how do I build? So developers are trying to figure out what are apps looking like, how do I code them? Andreessen Horowitz had a, a, an architecture stack that came out, Madrona has the same thing. It's changing rapidly, Dave. The workflows and the pipelining of how developers are building big data, now AI apps is changing every single day. So until that settles, there's no market yet for the scaling up side. So we saw this movie before, and let me give you an example. In the early cloud days, okay, the target developer was the person who would have to provision a data center, an entrepreneur, buy a machine, put it on the network, right? Dave, that's the, and then Amazon came around, swiped the credit card. Okay, you remember those days? Of course. It was basic stuff, EC2, S3, and Q. Now I'm oversimplifying, it was, it was good stuff, but it was not a lot of complex stuff. So it was good enough to run my app versus the alternative of buying a server, going to a data center. And so the dynamic of cloud computing started with basic building blocks that targeted the developer alternative cost and, and pain. Boom, cloud's born. The exact same thing's happening in AI right now. All the actors on the developer of apps and AI and data, which combines analytic tools, old school data people, new school data people like Mongo and the developers, they're all trying to figure out how to do that, do it. Now, Amazon's got good enough and there's new software coming out, but that won't pop until the developers get their, get their shit together. You know what I'm saying? So, so that's where it's at, Dave, and it's clear. And I think Amazon's in a great position as people roll into town looking for picks and shovels, you know, that's going to hit them. So I am not well, concerned about Amazon and Azure and Google not being, quote, ready, booking massive revenue. Hype something no, no, is open I, AI for sure, I, but the developers, and that's why Mongo's doing so well. They hit well, the developer gold rush. I, I, I think, I mean, you're right on the developers. Did, did you see that, Andreessen put on a post this week on, it's called the Emerging Architectures for LLM Applications. It's going all over yeah. Twitter. And, and, and right and in there, it basically laid out the emerging LLM stack and it's it's developer developers are going to be all over this. I mean, it, it's not as simple as you know you might think with the, listening to the all in podcast guys. Like, oh yeah, you just push a button and everything happens. It's not that simple, okay. And so it is all about the developers. The other thing that was really interesting about that when you look in there, first of all, Databricks is all over the place. They're everywhere in that stack. So is OpenAI though, and ChatGPT as a as an orchestrator. You can actually use people are using ChatGPT as the orchestrator and feeding uh, uh, the prompts in, so they can do 
uh, uh, really get better data, use few shot versus no shot prompts. In other words, yeah. prompting the model, many LLMs today use no prompts. Okay. So it's sort of just guessing if you can, if you can use chat GPT to actually create prompts and give it a few shot. And the other thing is the importance of GPT-4 is really, really a big deal. And you can't get access to GPT-4 unless you're, you know, a developer and you've got a, you're a developer of status. So, but you see the, the public cloud guys are all over that. And you're also seeing guys like Hugging Face all over that stack. You didn't see a lot of Snowflake, a little bit it, of Streamlit, it, it was, but not a lot of Snowflake. Okay, Databricks is all over that. That's any scales on there too, by the way. Oh, both portfolio yep. companies of Andreessen Horowitz. Of course, they're pimping their, their company. Well, I, I know that, but it's obviously- It's, it's, not, a, it's, it's, not, a their, it's the, not a leadership slide. It's just a stack slide. And so they represent well, their companies in there uh, appropriately. I, I, so you know you can't. I mean, they missed all. They missed. They missed a bunch of vector databases. They missed the Linux Foundation's work in there. So again, this was a this was a post by Andrews and Horowitz. It wasn't far from the definitive answer, but it is accurate. Well, they even, but they even said that they said, look, this is not a definitive. But they, it was. I mean, I've seen other ones, but I thought this one was a little bit more comprehensive. Oh, it was um, than, than other just, ones that I've just, seen. It's just not. It's just not, you can't just say because Databricks was mentioned multiple times, just saying, of course. I mean, I like Databricks, we'll govern them next week, but. No, my point is that Databricks is in different parts of the stack. It's not just in one place. Like Streamlit was there for app hosting, but Databricks is in multiple layers of that stack. And I, you know, I think it's, it's worth noting. I mean, I think next week you're going to see, first of all, I think next week you're going to see Databricks put, put forth a really strong story, but I also think Snowflake is as well. I think you're going to see Snowflake, just like you saw with Mongo, I think it's going to be even more dramatic with Snowflake, where they're going to expand the number or the types of workloads and, and data types that they can extend to. They're going to stretch their fabric, if you will, yeah. their mesh out to many more data types. And so they're really, Snowflake's really not in that conversation in a big way. Um, like you said, it's the Andreessen Mafia. Okay, fine, but I think next week you're going to see Snowflake make some serious moves, really attracting data uh, application builders. That, that they're going to be all over that. They they want to be number one in data apps. And we just wrote the Uber post last week. You know, George and I, you saw that it went friggin' nuts. It went viral. It was all over the place, and it got a lot of really good traction. And it basically, I think, lays out the future of data apps, except. You know, not everybody's Uber, right? You can't, not everybody has guys like Uday and a freaking team of a thousand people that can do this stuff. So that's where the future is, is being able to build these horizontal data apps. And it's going to take a while because yeah. it's complicated. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, mean I agree. And, and again, not everyone is Uber. And if you look at the numbers and you look at the research that we've done, okay, specifically the reporting that we've done on Mongo, okay. If you look at Mongo, and I posted this in my post, not everyone's Uber, and that's the opportunity. Not, that's a feature, not a bug. So managed services have been dominating. If you look at Mongo's numbers pre-Atlas as a managed service, it was nothing, okay? They surged on the managed services revenue. That is how people are getting in the game right now as a managed service, and all the smart money right now is looking at these VCs saying, you gotta be a managed service in here, and you gotta have an open source implementation. So I think you're going to see you know, some refactoring of these pivots or pivots and refactoring going on with startups. And the big companies also have the ability to pivot. Again, agility in this new world is not just uh, uh, for startups and small companies. Big companies can pivot too. And I think Amazon did that with packaging their AI stuff to be the infrastructure for the developers as they get rolling into town with their apps. So, you know, the, the, the only issue I have with, and, and concern around the, the data definition of data apps is not so much the direction of it, it's more of how it plays out. I'll give you an example. If you look at the database market right now, you look at like we just came to HPE and Mongo, we're gonna be at Databricks and Snowflake next week. Those are the big data titans, uh, those three at least. And then you got big HPE and you've got Amazon out there. The big trend is you got two markets. You got the, you got the old school database people, the analytics, they think differently. They're critical, they get old school thinking. And then you get the new school data analysts and the data people. They're much more like iterate fast, you know, move fast, try this, pull back, horizontal layer, no problem. I love doing that. Let's get vertical and get some domain data in there. They're looking at data architecturally like a cloud architect. 
Okay, not a data architect, they're thinking it like a cloud architect. So you're starting to see maybe a cultural shift in the data industry, Dave. I'm an analytics person, where's my dashboard? Well, in the, in the future model, data will be invisible and it'll be operational, it'll be historical, all working together with developers. So you start to see the, the signs of, you know, hey, you're, you, you were around in the old days, you know, you're an analytics person, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, they look at it from that lens. So again, the, 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 the lens you look through defines what you're, what you're staring at in the data business. And I think that's something to take pause in because I think that's gonna impact what enterprises do. Because, oh yeah, this is the way we've always done it. Well, not really. The developers are gonna start getting in charge and, you know, this idea of developer first could change a lot of those, those workflows, those, those cultural dynamics, the culture of building, and the culture of how to store and manage data, right? So, you know, I'm looking at that very closely this week. I'm gonna look at some of the, some of the signals and put the AI washing aside, look at who's the persona that they're targeting. Who's the customer? Well, you, you, you just laid out like 15 topics. I want to I want to pick on one that you <laughs> mentioned about five minutes ago, which was your point about managed services is so is so important. And you remember when Databricks first came out and Spark sort of first hit the market, everybody thought like they pattern matched. They said, oh, Databricks is gonna do what Cloudera did. And they didn't. They said, no, we're going to do managed service in the cloud. They did exactly the opposite, really, of what Cloudera did. Yeah. And that put them on a really successful track. And I, you know, again, you can't help but be impressed with what Databricks is doing. I, I, I can't be at the conference next week. You're going to be out there. I'm excited about that. You're broadcasting there as well. Where are you going to be at the, you're going to be at the International? I we're, mean, going the, be, uh, we're going to be at Moscone. We're going to be broadcasting that Cube is doing as an appearance for an hour and a half each day, Wednesday and Thursday, in the Lake House studio. It's called the Live uh, live at the Lake House, because uh, they have the Lake House products. So Do you also have a room at the Intercontinental, or am I mistaken No, we have a that? room at the press room in Moscone, not the press event. They're doing a press event Tuesday for press and analysts. That's think that's on, off the record or pre-brief. And you can there. broadcast there too, or are you just broadcasting in the lake house? I could, but I don't think we're going to bring cameras. I want to focus on the, on the content, and get the interviews, and start lining people up for camera. But yeah, we're video first, and the Continental's tight, Dave. You know how tight it is the hallways there, and then they got the ballroom, so um, right, it's tight. To get, it would be a run and gun and a lot of logistics. So we're we're going to pass on that for now. We got plenty of content coming. Believe me, Rob Stretchy and I are going to be in the lake house. And we're also going to pop into the press room. Uh, Gabe on our team is leading that effort, and, and it's going to be, you know, all gravy. You know, the lake house is primary, and uh, gravy is going to be in the press room. We get interviews people. So we're going we're gonna to get other analysts on. I saw Sanji Mohan, okay, at, and Maribel Lopez at the MongoDB event. I know Sanji is going to be there for sure. Doug Henson from Constellation is going to be there. So there'll be a lot. They're going to be at Snowflake too. They're going to bounce. They're going to you know, bounce gonna be from bouncing. one to the other. That's the, they were all pitching and moaning. All the not this is inside baseball now. The industry analysts they go all the events. They get they get come in. They get wine and dine, and and they get briefed, and they're all pissed off because they have to fly to both events, and so they they sneak out of one to go to the other, so they don't look like they're favoring one or the other. But they don't do a good job because they can't get the coverage. But this is this is why I think. It's interesting to see the vendors and Databricks. It's kind of a sub subplot story. The overall big whales fighting it out, but Databricks counter programming directly head to head against Snowflake, forcing people to make a decision. That's interesting. Well, and, and you're going to see the people make a decision and play, or play it down the middle. Now, good news, you and I are both data analysts, so we're going to be at both. You can cover Snowflake. I'll cover Databricks, and we'll meet after and, and roll out probably what hundred videos. Yeah, we will. And what, what I want to do, I mean, we've been on this. I mean, well, we've been on big data since, you know, 2010. That we're the queue, one of the domains it started in. What I want to do, and we've been leading up to, I mean, it's post Snowflake and Databricks last year. We, we, we crushed it, I think, post AWS reInvent. And then leading up to Snowflake and Databricks this year, we've been really hitting hard, starting with March of the Databricks post. We did a Snowflake post. We did the Uber post. We're going to unpack what we do next week. And then I, what I'd love to do, John, is have like a little, little future of data, like take everything we learned this past year and take a checkpoint, like in July checkpoint and say, okay, where are we? And what does the future of, of data apps look like? 
and then let's come up with yeah. you know sort of our model for that. I mean, we we basically got the framework there, and let's let's run these companies through that framework and try to project how it's going to shape. Let's do it. That sounds like a research product right there. I'm so glad we got so much research, Dave. God, so much research. Yeah. It's unbelievable, John. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's weird. This came up um, at Snowflake. It came up at HP. It also came up at Amazon Reinforce, and it came up at MongoDB. The role of the analyst, and because we're so different, the Cube with SiliconANGLE and Wikibon, we're open source. And, and I think people are now starting to get this, but they still, they're still banging their head against, well, you, but you're press and you're an analyst. And like, no, John's an analyst. Some people think I'm an analyst. Some people think you're a reporter and vice versa. And uh, we're all analysts. We all getting the data. That's what our job. We are with the Cube. Is, the Cube is the data gatherer all these interviews. Well, okay? and you we, know we that site. Like and we report and we analyze, but it's all open. It's free. And so people go, we are like, I don't get it. You're not charging. We make money on sponsorships. And you know, the smart analyst relations teams are getting it. They go, I get it, you're better. You're better and faster and, and, and more on point. So well, you, you, this open source content model is gonna be booming. I'm, I'm gonna predict that that's gonna be copied by pretty much everyone in the next couple of years. You know that site, a a a AR Insights, which I didn't even really know what they were. I mean, I, every now and then you'd see them. I never knew what it was. Well, they, I look, look, looked at their algorithm. Basically, they have a weighting system and they count blogs as 10%, they count research as 60% weight. <clears throat> so I reached out to them, they're like, we publish every week, like detailed research. They're like, oh, show us. So I showed them, the, what a breaking analysis looks like. They go, yeah, yeah, this is research. So we're gonna, we're gonna recategorize your, your, you yeah, from blogs to yeah, research. Shoot to number one. And then all, all of a sudden it's like, I cracked the top 50. I'm like, okay, well, they, <laughs> We got to get a. We got to get a. We got to get them to go back in time and count those too. So uh, yeah, I'll be number <laughs> one. I, I was advising a CMO the other day about social media and how we're the digital media model we're doing, and you know it's interesting. There's so much change going on in the industry. Even our own industry is impacted. The public relations departments and analyst relations departments they're affected by the new model because there's influencers now out there that have such domain expertise, but they're not an analyst or they're people like me that's reporting but free. It doesn't look like an analyst on paper, but the, moving the market with the analyst kind of picture. So they, they want to put you in a bucket. But the problem is, is that analysts get the data and the press people give stories. So for us, we're story centric. We want more stories. So we don't really want to take sides. We want the stories from the, from the public relations team. And we want the analyst relations data and access to the executives. And it's always been this world of, separation okay and i think that's that's a, the wrong approach i think you know you start to see unification on, on platforms we talk about that with data the same is happening inside companies where cmos are merging analyst relations and public relations under one umbrella and letting that leader make these calls on getting the stories to the storytellers that happen to be analysts so, so well, analysts don't do what we do right so like we're the, like we're like the, the black sheep right now well, you know, the inside baseball on this, and you know this well, is that when you, you have AR, a lot of companies, AR and PR, and they're just two stovepipes. And if you're a journalist, you're an AR, and if you're an analyst, you're in PR, but they don't know what to do with guys yeah. like us <laughs> and others. But but as you as you as you know, that seventy percent of the AR team's time is spent trying to get in the upper right of the magic quadrant, right? They spend all the time with Gartner. And the the other thirty percent of that, they spend half their time dealing with IDC numbers because they gotta you know show the numbers, and IDC does a good job there. A little bit of Forrester, or maybe some of the other you know you know tier two term firms, yeah. and then everybody else is left fighting for that fifteen percent. So the the way you have to participate in that is you have to do more than just conventional research. If you try to just copy Gartner and do your own version of a magic quadrant or a Forrester wave or IDC Marketscape. You can do that, but you're not going to get their attention. You have to get their attention in other ways. And the way you do that is through social media. You, you, you do videos and the like. And so that makes people's head explode because they don't know what to do with you. Well, are you PR? Well, are you AR? And they just go, ah, it's, forget it's, it. It's worse than that too when you add in the event teams. And the other thing that's going on that's the negative trend of seeing some companies revert to this is the events have lost their focus. They become money-making profit centers. And the goal of an event is about the content and the people who drive the content. That's the comms team, the analysts, listening, and the executives who put the content together to communicate to their customers on what their values, is. it's a developer conference, it's a user conference, it's a customer conference. The goal is to get the, the product of content into the 
people who show up, which are customers, to help the business move forward, not to make money. And so you're seeing event teams like get so focused on monetization that they're actually taking their eye off the ball and screwing their own customers over and partners. So that's another one. And I've seen events where PR people are completely blocked by the events team. And oh, you're just a stakeholder. And that's bad. And you, you see, start, so when you start to see that trend, you know the wheels are going to come off the bus of those companies. And that's a, a tell sign of post-COVID desperation around money making around events. And events were never totally to be a profit center, and they become them for the big companies. You know, VMware, AWS, IBM, Google, they make money from their events. And no. if they take that over and make them too profligate at the expense of the customer, then well, that's not the purpose of the event. The best events started with for the practitioners, for the practitioners and by the practitioners. And you think about the original VM worlds, remember those? And it was just all the VMware geeks would get together and they'd share best practice. EMC world was the same way. ServiceNow, the early ServiceNows, I think the first one was actually down in San Diego. And um, you know, it was very small and intimate. And then it grows, they grow, they grow, they grow, they grow. And you're right, people start making money at, at these things. And, and the objective of the event shifts you know still there's some events even reinvent when you think about reinvent john the original reinvents were it was really very developer centric it was a learning and conference a whole it was a learning conference it it's kind of become an ecosystem event and which which is good in a way because the ecosystem is so vibrant uh but it's sort of lost that core uh in a way because it's, it's yeah. like the yogi bear nobody goes anymore it's too crowded yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, or or if they don't take care of their customers who want who are the main players that go to the event to learn and to, to do business or partners who are jointly partnering with Amazon. It's about the content and the experience, not a gouging situation, right? So, you know, this is where I think events are going to go. And again, this is more of a microcosm of how structural things are changing with cloud and data. Again, media is just like another th application, right? So, and, and we, and that's our little lens here. But, but speaking of services, by the way, Dave, you mentioned as a service and managed service, HPE Discover was very illuminating. Antonio Neri made a bet six years ago, everything as a service. Everyone was laughing at him, not laughing, like, but you know, kind of metaphorically speaking, they were kind of like, ah, come on, really? Um, we even were somewhat critical, although we thought it had legs, but we didn't think he could pull it off. At least I didn't think, I had to eat my words on that, but HPE definitely succeeded. He never wavered, okay? And the momentum they have is amazing. Amazon, Matt Wood was on stage, AWS, Matt Wood, senior person was on stage with Antonio Neri. That to me was a very tell sign that HPE has made a good move here. They're partnering with the public cloud to operationalize hybrid cloud as a service. And you know, you can throw darts at the product evolution because it's still early days. They're making some moves and they're getting better and better. But directionally, this is a money maker. Uh, yeah, and, so I and think the company's behind it. I mean, this is like amazing. This is, I think that last thing you said is key. The, the company's behind it because Antonio Neri had to get, and, I, and I've talked to him about this, many people have. You know, you have product groups and they want to optimize for the product group and optimize it because they got P&Ls and they got objectives to hit. But what doing what's best for that individual P&L might not be what's best for the overall company. So Antonio has had to like get people in a little bit of a headlock and the key has been Aruba. That acquisition, we talked about this on theCUBE the other day, it's been, a, I said it's a home run, you said no, Dave, it's like a double grand slam. So they no, use you, Aruba you, Central. You, for, you said grand slam, I said multiple. Yeah, you said, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Right, I mean, it was pretty amazing. So, but they use Aruba Central uh, for the console for GreenLake. They're bringing Aruba IP into the storage business, which I've always said, it's gotta be more profitable. They put Tom Black in charge of the, the storage business, who's an Aruba guy, great guy actually, is really interesting getting to know him a little bit. You know, he used to work for Jay Shree. I had dinner with him down in Houston in, in April and he was telling me, I said, oh, you used to work for Arista. I said, Jay Shree's like a business hero of mine. I love Jay Shree Ulal, she's amazing. And uh, he goes, I used to meet at her house every Friday. They would go over, I think he said every Friday and they would, all the engineers would meet and they'd geek out and, you know, have a few beers or whatever. And um, and yeah, so he's got that DNA. It's interesting to see the networking DNA, John. We saw this at Cisco as well, you know, with, with, with Jonathan Davidson bringing together the cloud platform and Cisco and networking and security coming together. You know, we heard that from HPE, Phil Mottram this week. 
Uh, we're going to be talking about that at SuperCloud 3 in July. So, um, yeah, and then the other big news at HPE Discover was LLMs as a service. Uh, we were just, we just, I just had Rob Streche and Andy Tarai in here. We were unpacking that. Um, I, I think there was a little skepticism there, but I like the play. I mean, they're basically saying Antonio Neri's, He's ballsy. He's saying, I'm not putting my supercomputing IP in the cloud, in the public cloud. I'm going to build my own cloud. I'm going to take a shot. I, I like that. I, I like that differentiable strategy. It's a little Oracle-like. Unfortunately, they don't have the software stack and the application stack that Oracle and the database that Oracle has. But for an infrastructure company, they've got to do things to differentiate because they, unlike Dell, they can't just go volume yeah, and, and just have mega supply chain, they, right? They've got to have- Just on that point, I thought to, um, in Mongo, I learned, I learned from a source, I won't say their name, um, um, but according to sources, there's a development of long tail of power law developing a long tail of clouds. There's now 19 clouds outside the big three emerging. Okay, and, and I, I heard this through some of the developers out there saying, hey, you know, I partnered with Amazon, Google, because you know, Mongo had partnered with Google, it was a big deal. And I had, I had Google, I had AWS, Google, and Microsoft all on theCUBE this week at MongoDB Day. That's a first, okay, at an event, okay? Steve Orban, former AWS, now runs Google Migrations, and we had an, someone from M, uh, Microsoft on all three hyperscalers. But I learned that there's 19 other clouds. So, so specialty clouds it, are emerging. These are super clouds, Dave. This is what we're talking about. And well, they're, they're super clouds on a standalone category basis, as well as specialty cloud. Well, let's take, let's give some examples. I mean, there's, I, I, well, you got, you got another hyperscaler in, in Alibaba. Okay, fine, put that China cloud. Oracle's got a legit cloud, uh, and it's kind of the database cloud. You know, IBM, there's the remnants of IBM, they get like the financial cloud, but to your point, Mongo is building out sort of a super cloud-like uh, capability. Snowflake clearly is uh, of, of doing so. You've got the security companies, um, like a Zscaler. All the you know, or, All yep, the uh, yep, um, absolutely. And so, and of course the SaaS pl players now, are they are they building their own clouds? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I talked to a, an, um, an insurance company because Mongo does really well insurance companies. Um, you got the travels out there and some other folks who also worked at tra uh, companies like that were also around this kind of little huddle there. It was kind of like a bunch of about 10, 10 people I was hanging out with and, and I asked the question, if you become big in the vertical, don't you think you can service the other, other providers that aren't as good? They're like, absolutely, they talk about that. They actually have conversations that say, if we build on top of AWS, for instance, and become an amazing with MongoDB and insurance, they can then become a service provider to the people who don't make those investments. And the investment isn't in CapEx, it's, it's in OpEx, it's in operating expenses and building that data layer. Okay, because as they get bigger, they get more data, they're driving the value. They see themselves as being a service provider not as the cloud for all insurance companies, but as a kind of a specialty cloud. And, and well, we talked about that two reinvents ago, and it's playing out now in AI where it's you have the data, you win. And that's where I think we're starting to see some visibility into the into the functionality, and now the unit economics are starting to roll in. Well, to your point, so Antonio, when I was interviewing him on theCUBE this week, he said, I, I'd like to think that we're going to be you know, the fourth cloud. And I said, well, of course, Larry Ellis has got something to say to that, but to your point, he basically wants to be the supercomputing cloud. And we were just sort of debating this today, whether the, the strategy, HPE strategy has merit. I, I'm sort of more positive on it. I think Andy and Rob were a little bit negative, but for the reasons that you just mentioned, because the data they're saying is, yeah. is and I agree, is all in the cloud. But I'm okay if there's if there's a niche that can be profitable, That's because the, the supercomputer data, HPE obviously has access to that, and they could, they could tuck in and get a little niche going this there is where this, and make money. This is where the big three could compete with each other. I'll give you an example. I should do a post on this or a report, but you know, the power law, then the long tail. You remember during the record industry when they started you know, losing, there was like only three providers. It was like a big, long, straight down there on a long tail in the power yeah. law, like straight down, mm -hmm. almost a cliff. Only a few people at the top. Now you're going to start to see that, that, that curve pull out, you're gonna to start to see the neck and torso develop in the in the in that you know head, neck, torso and tail versus straight down, no neck, no torso, and then just the tail. 
you know, you saw that in the record industry, and then in comes Apple, and they blew that up, and Spotify and Napster, right? So, so that the music industry was was basically anemic. They had no neck, no ta only tail, right? Evergreen. So, I think in the cloud business, if you start to see these specialty clouds come in, Amazon, if Amazon doesn't go after it, Google will. And I, if I was advising them, maybe like I would be watching that space because that's what I think Amazon's actually doing is they're creating this second tier or neck and torso in the power law that's under the hyperscalers functionality and scale, but big enough to be a provider of something. And that's where I think data is going to come in. That's why managed services are so popular because that, that piece is developing. We'll see, you know, we're so, watching it. We don't, we're starting to see the signs of it, but have not seen anyone pop out of that yet. And I think the Andreessen thing pointed at that. Yeah, so, and so but and I want to- You saw and it, hugging face. In another good VC post, going back to just before we came up with SuperCloud, was Jerry Chen's castles in the cloud, and he used the term subcloud, and that's kind of what you're talking about here as well. We yeah. like, we we thought super because if you know above, uh, supra Latin for super, you know Latin for above, not the superlative of super, but but that's there's all these other clouds forming, whether they're subclouds or super clouds, um, or both actually. Uh, I, I think it's a real trend that we identified. A yeah. couple of years ago, actually, and then uh, again, SuperCloud was kind of inspired by Jerry's post. We really started thinking about it, and then, of course, Fitzy and we had some fun yeah. with it. So. so let's change the subject to. We, I want to save time for the rant section on Amazon getting sued by the uh, by Lena Khan. Intel's in the news, Dave. Okay, just did a, uh, an announcement to plan twenty five billion in Israeli chip manufacturing plants. Some say it's ten billion on the surface, um, but up to twenty five billion. Two chip fabs in Germany as part of an expanded, you know, euro thirty billion euro investment. Okay, then you got um, they sold, or they sold twenty percent stake in the chip manufacturing technology supply that they had. They got two, four billion in sales of that, and then um, the stock dropped. Okay, so you know, you've written, you've talked about it with David Floyer and many other analysts on our team about rebuilding Intel. Foundry versus IDM, decades of inefficiencies unraveled was a post we did. Um, I think that was a, uh, uh, something that you guys did a while back. Yeah. So what, what's it, what, knows. what is the strategy? Do you like their moves? <laughs> I mean, Pat's taking huh. photo, selfies in, in all over the world. Here's the thing. I mean, it, it, Intel, they know how to spend money. And I guess they have to. Do I like their moves? I, the, Pat is doing everything possible Every, if, if you had said, okay, you, you, I want you to save Intel and I don't want you to give up Foundry. And so I think, go back when, before he made his big announcement that we're, they're stick, sticking with integrated manufacturing, but they're also going to make another run at Foundry. What he could have done at that time is said, and, and he could have said, we're going to spin out Foundry as a separate company uh, and we're going to get that CapEx weight off our shoulders and we're just going to focus on design and we're going to outsource our manufacturing to intel to help them get going with foundry and we're going to outsource to tsm and samsung etc rather than do that he said no we're going to go we're going to stay with the vertically integrated approach but we're going to manufacture other people's uh, designs and that's been you know slow to get off the ground and the problem is that, you know, Sarbjeet tweeted about this, is investors don't like uncertainty. They also don't like when you're spending a ton of cash and you could go bankrupt. <laughs> I mean, that's not good. So I, I I think Pat's doing everything humanly possible and it's good for the, for the country if he can pull it off. But I still think their problem remains, they don't have the economies of the other foundries, Samsung in particular, or TSM in particular, but also Samsung. So I think their best hope is to be a, a distant third in terms of foundry. Um, so I'm, I'm not optimistic in the near term. I mean, I think it's going to take a long, 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 long time. Crawford, uh, uh, did you see the tweet that Sarbjeet did? He, Crawford, he's so creative, Sarbjeet. He took a, a, a conversation in Twitter and then he applied it in a graphic of Crawford giving a speech. Crawford Del Pret, the president of IDC, should really be called the CEO because that's what he does. But basically saying, don't confuse, uh, you know, basically clear vision with a short-term path, something along those lines. And, and 
I think that was a really good impression quote because basically Pat is absolutely right on. He sees the vision clearly, but the path to get there is a long, long ways off. So, you know, it's, I don't know if you've seen the Arnold uh, special on Netflix. I haven't, I haven't seen it, but I saw the little highlights of it where he like visualizes becoming, you know, the weightlifting or the bodybuilding championship. He visualizes becoming a star actor. He visualizes becoming a governor. So maybe Pat's just going to manifest it with his vision, but it's a long ways off. I mean, he's got to make moves. That's a good sign. But it goes to show you that a lot of things we were reporting and others were that they are have a lot of troubles and they got to they got to they're flat footed. And this is what happens when you have shifts in markets. Right. So um, Intel, you know, should take its own advice. The paranoid only the paranoid survive. And I think you're right. Gelsinger's got a will that's got an Andy Grove style. I've always said it. Um, but you know, and then, but Intel has this machinery that's built out over the past two decades of just, I won't say mediocrity, but like just chugging along. Same old, same old, you know, Groundhog's Day, same, wake up, do the same thing over again. So I like the bold move, okay? I like to shake things up. And I think, you know, what past the challenges are internal um, and people in the Intel, the, half the people want them to shake things up and the other half don't want to rock the boat. Okay, we know well, we, we know what that means. That means there's a lot of dead wood floating around. So, but he may have to spin off Foundry at some point. Yeah. They may have to do that um, because it's just it's a such a capital intensive business and one that it's going to be really hard for Intel to fund and, well, and you know, they, cycles too, right? Operating cycles. All right, Jay, let's get into the rant. FTC looks for a win in small places. That's the headline topic. What a, what FTC, a joke. FTC right? so, sues Amazon over Prime's sign-up and cancellation interfaces. Okay, Amazon so, has been upfront about everything. I've talked to Jassy about it. I've talked to other people about it in, in, in policy world. Amazon's saying, hey, you know, we're simple. We, we, don't, we encourage competition. We just want to make things you know, go faster and cost less and, and help consumers. And, but every the FTC wants to go after them. My big issue is this is what they're doing. And I know you have some uh, data on this, so on cancellation. So the, the, the so-called alleges, they're hurting people because they lock you into Prime and it's hard to unwind or uh, cancel, okay? So that's their, that's, their credibil that's their credibility on the line. And I think it's a major black eye for her, Lena Khan, and the FTC that this is all they got. It's terrible, it's an embarrassment. Um, you want to talk about like hiding the ball? Google does this all the time. Other services I've seen. Tens Everybody does. Ten I mean, million. Like, how do I get out of this? Or, or you know, like that service I put my credit card down. This is just BS, and it's just terrible. I mean, by the way, as a consumer, you know, I don't like that either. But the, the, to your point, this is what you got. This is it. This is what you're going after. First of all, Prime is awesome. Okay. And, I, and I, I was at a conference maybe five or six years ago and the speaker, it was like a TED Talk class talk. The guy was great. And he said, hands up if they have Amazon Prime. Everybody put their hands up. And he said, you know that Amazon's algorithms know that you're willing to spend more. So they'll put offers in front of you and you, so you'll end up, because you're a Prime account, you'll end up spending more. And and because you have a you know higher taste, whatever. And he said, now knowing that, who wants to cancel their Prime account? Nobody. Every hand went down because Prime is great. Yeah. It's a huge consumer benefit. You, you, you even have same day shipping now. You order at like 7 a.m. and you get the thing in the evening. It's unbelievable. And I mean, Amazon has, ch has changed our lives in a good way for consumers. And yet the FTC, this is, they want to go after them and shut them down. It's, it's just so stupid. Did, you, I mean, do a, did, did you do a little spot check on the on the cancellation legitimacy? Yeah, it took me six clicks. Take six through, clicks. Take us through it, that. I mean, assume yeah. you're you're a luddite. Assume you're someone like you're like okay. What, take it okay. Through. So what you do, go to your Amazon account, right? And they were saying, oh, it's really hard to do on mobile. And I'm like, well, okay. Well, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go to my account. So I go to my account, and then. I go down and I go, oh, manage Prime membership. Okay, so I go manage my Prime membership, manage that, and I scroll down and there it is. And it's like, cancel my membership. Okay, I mean, it's like six clicks. 
And then, yeah, there's some choices there. Are you sure you want to go? And I'm on my, yeah. on my account. I scroll down. My, I hit your account. There it is. One click. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's like, it's it's like you manage your membership, end your membership, end the membership, and it's like, it's like, okay, done. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. You do got to hunt and peck for it, but it's it's a menu. It's not hiding the ball. Well, but so but but they basically I don't. They're basically saying you okay end the membership, and what what the FTC is objecting is to say wait you know. Hey, before you go, you know, just you got all this time because you pay to, to use your your benefit. Do you still want to cancel? Yeah, I still want to cancel. Are you sure you want to cancel? Yes, I'm sure I want to cancel. I mean, it's not that difficult to cancel. Maybe it's a little bit annoying. In, if you I'm, really I'm in, want to I'm cancel. I'm in on three clicks. Yeah, fourth, right. I mean, fourth it's click it, it, is, it, fourth click is check a box and no, not even in membership. That's yeah. Four clicks. Yeah, and they just want to make make sure you. So I went through it. I don't want to cancel it, and if they do have a little remind me later. You sure you want it? Well, you want some time to think about it. What's wrong with that? You know, it's like actually, I mean, I don't know. Like I said, like you said, this is the best they got going after Amazon. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's dumb. And then the point I'm, Lena Khan has completely changed the mindset. It's like. Her dogma injected into how she wants to see these companies run, not whether or not it really hurts consumers. Does that really hurt consumers? Has Prime hurt consumers? No. It's, it's free shipping, two day shipping, free two day shipping. Has that hurt consumers? It creates barriers to entry. My argument, again, I'm, first of all, I agree, I like Prime. My argument would be, if I was going to put my intellectual hat on, would be that it, there is an argument from one side of the coin that says Amazon's continued growth becomes a monster. Okay, it becomes so hard to compete against that that the barriers to entry that market is too high because of their success. Okay, so this is again we've ranted about the, you become too successful they want to take you down. That's what's happening here, and you know that well, that's a function of capitalism. And I think this is an interesting point because you know as they get bigger, okay, they they're it's harder to get in. Okay, I'm gonna, let's let's leave it there. Let's just assume that that's the argument, which I don't agree with, by the way. Look at what we were just talking about with Intel. They were a company that was untouchable two decades ago, Dave. Yeah. Okay, untouchable. Market share, great processors, industry standards. Look at them now. They're flat-footed on their heels. Restructuring. Okay. So now big, I'm gonna, big can be toppled. More rants. So the history of antitrust in this country it, it, with tech has been a joke. Okay, I'm just going to say it. And and again, Lena Khan, she gets up, she does her revisionist history and talks about how it was it was they who moderated Microsoft. No, it wasn't. I mean, yeah, they were there and and IBM and how they affected IBM and so that others could build applications. Uh, okay, you know, the, 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 some of that is true. I don't want to completely dismiss that, but the real factor in moderating these companies was self-inflicted wounds, crossing the chasm issues. And so in the case of Amazon, you know, they've got way more challenges than, in my opinion, than the FTC. I think the FTC is just, if they break the law, you got to go after them. I totally agree with that. But they will figure out a way, like every company always does, to miss something, you, you have a blind you spot. I, you and I disagree on this. Like we'll, again, it's the end of the podcast. We're going for another What do we disagree on? The self-inflicted wounds. Microsoft in particular, they, didn't, they, they had self-inflicted wounds because of the, F, of the FTC. Okay. So let me, let me explain. I disagree. Let me explain. I do disagree. Yeah, let you're me, right. We disagree. We disagree. Well, you're just making all these assumptions and hand-waving. But, but let me just go, go, go. I do agree with you. There, it's a joke. But here's the problem with the joke. It's just, it's like putting, it's like pulling uh, you over every single time you just go over 55 miles an hour and everyone's going 80, okay? You get to get dragged down and you're distracted. So these companies definitely were affected. I remember when Bill Gates got the news. I was at a conference when, he, when they did it and he, his, his minions went there. He never did a public appearance after that for a long, long time. I, I can't recall after 1997 when they filed that, Janet Reno, I remember that vividly. Bill Gates used to be out in the public all the time doing talks. He didn't do it anymore. And then search came. Yeah, they had MSN, they had some search and other things. They missed it because they were distracted. I'm not saying, and then you call that self-inflicted. That's just, 
You get pulled over too many times, you're on the side of the road, everyone's passing you. And I think that's the effect that this is. It's got no teeth. And so what they do is they make it inconvenient. And they, they create a drag on the company uh, so that those wounds that are inflicted are inflicted because they're handcuffed. There's a lot more distractions, a lot more focus on it. You better off just paying the penance up front and then saying, taking the medicine and moving on. You know, so well, so that, that's well, my angle because they don't, this uh, is just another joke, right? So again, what's it going to do? Go to so I, 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 Andy's got to deal with it. Andy Jackson, the CEO, has got to get briefings. He's got to defend I, it. I, I guess there, I would say there's what are the unintended consequences? So, maybe, it, it, I, I don't I don't disagree with you. You're right that there is a distraction there, and it and it it doesn't certainly doesn't help the company's focus. But we know IBM lost its monopoly because it handed it over to Microsoft and Intel. Yes, that was by far the bigger factor rather That's than self inflicted. And, and and that was self-inflicted. They were past and, the DA, they were past the FTC there in the DOJ, right? They were right, but you could you but one but but Lena Khan would argue that that they moderated IBM back in the day, and that was true. They did to a certain extent. Uh, the DOJ actually it wasn't the FTC, I don't think. Um, but and then the AT and T, the breakup of AT and T. What did that do? It made the U.S. telecommunications business less competitive for a long, long time. Most of, some people argue it's still less competitive. And Bell Labs was <laughs> was sold. Okay. Bell Labs is owned by Nokia now. Who, who, okay? who installs a landline right now? Do you know anyone that still has a landline? I think half the population doesn't even know the word landline means. Well, but during the pandemic, a lot of people were using landlines. Were they? So, were they? Yeah, they were. For what? Yeah. Fax machines? Fax machines, <laughs> and then but but Microsoft. Uh, I mean, you know, I would argue that I would argue that Balmer was a was a Windows hugger, that he wanted to put Windows. Uh, remember, Microsoft wanted to put Windows on their their phone, right? And the thing was bloated. Yeah, the Windows. And bloated. and it, and it right wasn't until in. Satya came in, Microsoft was was largely irrelevant for ten years. Nobody cared what they did or said. Well, now look at them. The, the, uh, uh, we have a legit rant, and it comes up all the time. It's a pattern. We need better leadership in government around tech, for sure. There needs to be a coalition of some sort of karitsu, some sort of group that gets together, should talk about this, to have a doctrine that's real, have, have some real understanding of, the, of a systems thinking mindset impact to, to the ecosystem, understand how tech works. Uh, because it does affect all people now. It's not like the industry. You know, we were just talking about this at MongoDB. We did it at, uh, on our last podcast, too. Open source is now an industry. It's not like a, just an area, a community. So same with tech. It's, it affects everyone the, in the world. The standard to me should be, is the company breaking the law, okay, versus, like you say, driving 70 and a 55, like what Amazon is being accused of doing. So are they breaking the law and are consumers being hurt? You know, is there price fixing? Is there bundling? Um, are consumers being hurt? The new standard is, well, Lena Khan doesn't like it. Consumers might potentially, Microsoft Activision, well, consumers might be possibly potentially hurt by this. Anything Facebook wants to do or Meta wants to do, shut it right down because... They're too powerful. Power in and of itself. I mean, look at it, monopoly power does corrupt. I don't not say it doesn't. Well, I had but, I had a conversation but, with some people about this one point, Dave. You nailed it, which is Amazon is not hurting anyone, but you remember they have a lot of power as a company, and people who can wield that power could go down to the someone like in the sales organization. As you start getting motivated for money, whether it's chasing an event number or chasing a sales number, you might do things differently. Or hey, I'm the product manager in e-commerce and I want to sell more at the but no one's looking them and look the other way so if culture deteriorates where they can't police this that's when yeah. you got to look at the cultures and saying and there's scuttlebutt around that especially around cloud <clears throat> multi clouds got traction mainly because people want to negotiate deals better deals with amazon right so that's the number one reason when i ask people why would you go to another cloud it's because if, they want to do a license negotiation with aws but if i zoom out and i look at these big companies, even the social media companies, even Google, right, which is you know, sucking all our dollars from advertising and search. The big picture to me is they've added far more value, far more value for consumers than life without them. 
I, I would not want to be without a lot of the tools that we have today, whether it's what Apple invented, being able to use Google Maps or Apple Maps or Waze to get around. Um, it's made things a lot more convenient. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'm, I'm aware, I think I'm aware of the privacy concerns. Um, and I, but I make that trade off as a consumer. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm smart enough to make that. I don't need the government yeah. protecting me in that realm. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. Well, let's let's move on. We're going to close this down. Dave, it's been a long week. I know you're super tired of the red eye. I just got in from New York. Look, like I got the time zone on the other side. Did sleep on the plane a little bit, but uh, yeah, weekend's here. Let's recharge. Next week is massive. We got the, the data titans going at it. Databricks and Snowflake, that's going to be fun to watch. We comment at the top of the pod about that. Yeah, MongoDB now rising quickly, okay, as that third, you know, data platform player. A little bit different than the others, but definitely nailing developers. So, and it's open source. So I like that, those three. And you got everybody else in the hyperscale is with it. So we got that. And then, you know, we got SuperCloud on the 18th. We got people putting in sessions, requests to do sessions, Dave. And, and we're going to no. come out with a new logo that people want to put on a badge on their on their on their site so let's let's keep our eye on the ball there we got a lot going on we're gonna be burnt out let's get our pod next week don't don't blow that one you know you're gonna be tired you know i know uh, uh, i blew this well we just we have to reschedule it right we have to do it earlier so yeah well, that's cool i'll be ready we're doing um we're gonna get together Maybe you want to join us. Um, I think George is going to join us, Stretch A, maybe Andy, uh, just to do a data week, data brick, snowflake when? debrief. Friday. Yeah. Next Friday. Let's do a little, let's, we should do a Twitter spaces. Yeah, well, I want to do a breaking analysis. <laughs> All right, Dave, signing off, episode 17. If you like uh, the pod, share it with your friends. Again, we're getting our groove swing and, you know, bringing a lot more cube into the conversation because we're, that's what we're doing a lot of these days. But the stories are hitting in the industry. Enterprise tech is hot. AI is booming. We're going to continue to look at the stories, share that with you, what we're thinking about, and and uh, un, you know, and lay down the commentary and opinion, of course, unfiltered here on the cube pod. So thanks for listening. <laughs>